chapter fifteen of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva infatuation the season was at its height the rumson ball the warrington's dinner dance and some of the subscription affairs had passed into social history but a brilliant season of opera not yet half over and a dozen large dances were still to follow camilla sat at her desk assorting and arranging the cards of her many visitors recording engagements and obligations when jeff had left for the west she had plunged into the social whirlpool with a desperation born of a desire to forget and as she went out there had come a bitter pleasure in the knowledge that after all she had been able to win her way in new york against all odds people sought her now not because she was a protege of mrs worthington rumson or because she was the wife of the rich mr ray but because she was herself the dangers which threatened no longer caused her any dismay for ambition obsessed her it was an appetite which had grown great with feeding and she let it take her where it would there was not an hour of the day when she was not busy in the mornings with her notes and her shopping in the afternoons with luncheons teas and other smart functions at night with dinners the theatre or the opera and the calendar dances there were few opportunities for her to be alone and the thought of a reconciliation with her husband which had at one time seemed possible had been relegated to her mental dustbin in company with an assorted lot of youthful ideals which she had found it necessary to discard she could not remember the day when she had not been socially ambitious five months ago before she and jeff had quarrelled there had been a time when she had been willing to give up the world and go back with him she had been less ambitious at that moment than ever before in her life if he had taken her with him then there might still have been time to repair their damages and begin life on a basis of real understanding for a brief time she had abhorred the new life he had found for her had hated herself for the thing that she really was a social climber a pariah too good for her old acquaintances not good enough for her new ones a creature with a mission of intrusion a being neither fish flesh nor good red herring and yet perhaps something of all three but that period of mental probation had passed she no longer felt that she was climbing there were many broken rungs below her on the social ladder but those above were sound and her head was among clouds tinted with pink and amber such was the magic of success she lived in an atmosphere of soft excitements and pleasurable exhilarations of compliments and of flattery of violets and roses bridge lessons had improved her game but she still discovered that the amounts she could lose in a week were rather appalling checks for large amounts came regularly from the west and she spent them a little recklessly convinced that she was obeying to the letter her husband's injunction to strengthen their social position no matter what the cost she had written jeff twice in the first week after his departure asking if she could not follow him to mesa city his replies had been brief and unnecessarily offensive so that though his image loomed large at times pride refused further advances cortland bent had been with her continually and of course people were talking 
she heard that from mrs rumson who in the course of a morning of casual mothering had spoken to camilla with characteristic freedom i know there's no harm in his attentions child she said at least so far as you're concerned you have always struck me as being singularly capable of looking after yourself and of course court is old enough to know what he is about but it never does any one any good to be talked about especially a woman who has her way to make in the world there is a simplicity almost rustic in the way you two young people allow yourselves to be discovered in public places which to an ancient philosopher like myself carries complete conviction of innocence but others may not be so discerning if you were ugly or deformed it wouldn't make the slightest difference what you did but being handsome you are on trial and every pretty woman in society is on the jury of a court which convicts on circumstantial evidence alone camilla thanked her preceptor for the warning aware of an unpleasant sense of shock at the revelation she seemed to have reached a point in her mad infatuation with life where warnings made no impression upon her she had not seen court bent for several days now and while she experienced a vague sense of loss in his absence which had not been explained she was so busy that she had not even found time to analyze it a belated cold season had set in a season of snow and ice and fashionable new yorkers in a brief interlude of unimportant engagements flocked for the weekend to their country places to enjoy a few days of old-fashioned winter weather the billy haviland's farm was within motoring distance of the town it wasn't much of a place in the modern sense merely a charming old shingled farmhouse which had been remodeled and added to set in a big lawn like a baroque pearl in green enamel surrounded by ancient trees which still protected it with their beneficent boughs as haviland and his wife preferred the city in winter and went to their newport cottage in summer they only used the cove for small house parties between seasons it was kept open for just such occasions as the present one and camilla who had joined this party at the last moment was looking forward with enjoyment to a glimpse of winter life in a different sort of community snow had fallen during the night but the day was cold and clear one of those dry sparkling days like the winter ones in colorado when the sawatch peak was laid like a white paper cutting against the turquoise sky and the trees at timberline were visible in silhouette to the naked eye it was freezing hard and camilla's skin tingled sharply beneath her motor veil but she lay back in her warm furs beside dorothy haviland in the tonneau drinking deep breaths of delight as she watched the panorama of purple hills across the river the snow was not too deep for easy going but in places it had drifted across the road waist high rejoicing in the chance to test the mettle of his high-powered car haviland took these drifts on the high gear sending a cloud of iridescent crystals over and about his guests who pelted the unresponsive back of his head with snowballs farmers in sleighs and wagons on runners drew aside in alarm to stare with open mouths at the panting demon which passed them by before their horses had time to be frightened every ride with billy was a joy ride he hadn't driven this car in the vanderbilt cup race for nothing jack perrault clung to the robe rail and alternately prayed and swore in haviland's ear 
the baroness charny punctuated his remarks with cunning foreign cries and dorothy herself admonished him to be careful but camilla whatever she felt sat quietly between the two women her pulses going fast a prey to the new excitement of speed haviland had phoned his orders from the city to have the bobsled sent over to the country club and when they drove through the entrance gates the pond in the valley below the golf course was dotted with skaters a blue thread of smoke trailed skyward from the cabin of the fishing and skating club a part of the larger organization from which people came and glided forth by twos and threes over the glossy blue surface of the pond a surprise awaited the party for as the motor drew up at the steps of the golf house it was greeted by a storm of soft snowballs from a crowd ambushed in a snow fort on the lawn the motor party got out hurriedly laughing like children while billy haviland like a good general marshalled his forces under the protecting bulk of the machine while they threw off their heavy furs and made snowballs enough to sally forth valiantly to the attack the battle was short and furious until jack perrault and camilla by a dexterous flank movement assailed the unprotected wings and came to close quarters with the enemy larry gretchen cortland bent and rita chain a well-aimed shot by camilla caught cortland on the nose which disconcerted him for a moment and haviland improved his opportunity by washing rita's face in snow a truce was declared however but not before the besiegers had entered the breastworks and given three cheers for their victory i'll never forgive you billy laughed rita brushing the snow from her neck never i'm simply soaking spoils of victory you're lucky i didn't kiss you yes i am she said with sudden demureness i'd rather have my face washed the machine was sent on and chatting gaily the party made its way down to the cabin by the lakeside a path to which had been cleared through the snow camilla glanced at cortland bent who stood silently at her side what's the matter cort aren't you going to speak to me she asked carelessly he forced a laugh oh yes of course where have you been do you realize that i haven't seen you for the last two days four he corrected soberly i-i've been very busy that's no explanation you're angry no not at all i thought i'd better not come she examined him curiously and laid her fingers on his arm how funny you are has anything happened he didn't reply at once and kept his gaze away from her i came here to-day he said deliberately because i thought it would be the one place where you and i wouldn't meet oh and she turned away abruptly her chin in the air i'm sorry we needn't meet now and she hurried her steps but he lengthened his stride and kept pace with her you don't understand i don't care to understand you don't want to see me that's enough camilla please i'm not in the habit of pursuing the men of my acquaintance court i'll save you the trouble of avoiding me and with that she broke away from him and ran down the path joining the others at the door of the house his attitude annoyed her more because she couldn't understand it than because of any other reason what had come over him they had parted as friends with the definite assurance that they were to meet the next day she had been busy writing letters then but she remembered now that he had not called there was an unaccountable difference in his manner and he had spoken with a cold precision which chilled her she felt it in all the sensitive antennae which a woman projects to guard the approaches to her heart all that was feminine and cruel in her was up in arms at once against him 
he needed a lesson she must give it to him on the ice they met a merry party and billy haviland pointed them all out to camilla molly bracknell and her diminutive husband known in clubdom as the comic supplement jack archer the famous surgeon and his fiancee who had lost her appendix and her heart at the same time stephen gillis the lawyer who was in love with his pretty client mrs cheyne and didn't care who knew it is he really in love with mrs cheyne asked camilla oh yes threw over a girl he was engaged to he's got it bad worse than most of em what a pity rita's in good form this winter she has a charm for men dolly says she's a deluxe binding of a french novel on a copy of handley cross i guess it's true but i've always been afraid of rita why she's too infernally clever she don't like my sort she likes brainy chaps with serious purposes they're the kind that always take to her i think she knows i'm wise they crossed hands and camilla resolutely gave herself over to the pleasure of motion she skated rather badly a fact to be bewailed since rita cheyne was doing figure eights and corkscrews but with haviland's help she managed to make three or four turns without mishap but she refused to crack the whip and skated alone until cortland bent joined her he offered her his hand but she refused his help won't you go away please court i've got to see you to-night camilla he said suddenly where will you be as she wouldn't reply he took her hand and skated backward facing her you've got to see me camilla i can't i won't i'm going away to-morrow we've gotten along for four days without meeting she said airily i think i'll survive you're heartless i know it please get out of my way no not until you promise to let me see you you're seeing me now he took her firmly by the elbows listen camilla i'm leaving new york to-morrow for a long while perhaps for good for the first time she realized the importance of what he was saying and looked up into his eyes discovering something in their shadows she had not seen before is it true why are you going that's what i wanted to tell you may i see you to-night she considered a moment before she replied indifferently yes if you like i am at the havilands as they stopped before the cabin jack perrault joined them offering to take camilla for a turn but she said she was cold and the three of them went inside to the burning log larry and gretchen on the bench put a space between them rather suddenly don't move on our account larry said perrault mischievously your silhouettes through the window were wonderful quite touching in fact jack said gretchen her face flaming you couldn't see no as a matter of fact we couldn't because the shades are drawn the painter laughed immoderately <laughs> but you know we might have you're a very disagreeable person and i don't like you at all said miss janey i'll never let you do my portrait never ha ha he cried in accents of bowery melodrama at last geraldine i have you in me clutches i'm desperate and starving next week i paint your portrait or tell your father chaouz beautiful one in the laugh which followed larry joined good-naturedly indeed there was nothing left to do unless it was to wring the painter's neck instead of which he wrung his hand and whispered i wish you would perrault it'll save me the trouble the rest of the crowd appeared after a while and the steward brought hot scotches which detracted nothing from the gaiety of the occasion god made the country man made the town sighed billy sententiously holding the amber liquid to the firelight the simple pleasures the
the healthy sports of our ancestors eh rita oh yes with fine scorn quilting parties no bridge golf or tennis imagine a confirmed night owl like you billy tucked safely in bed at nine i'm often in bed at nine nine in the morning laughed perrault that's safe enough don't believe em camilla i'm an ideal husband aren't i dolly i hadn't noticed it oh what's the use sniffed mrs cheyne there's only one ideal husband who asked a voice solicitous and feminine oh some other woman's of course how silly of you rita said gretchen indignantly it's gotten to the point where nobody believes the slightest thing you say that's just what she wants laughed Cortland. don't gratify her gretchen mrs cheyne shrugged her shoulders and with a glance at camilla now the ideal wife court would be my own he interrupted quickly his face flushing i wouldn't marry any other kind that's why you haven't married Cortland, dear said rita assiduously camilla listened with every outward mark of composure her gaze in the fire conscious of the growing animosity in mrs cheyne they had met only twice since jeff's departure and on those occasions each had outdone the other in social amenities each aware of the other's hypocrisy in their polite interchange of compliments ray's name had by mutual consent been avoided and neither of them could be said to have the slightest tactical advantage but camilla felt rather than knew that an understanding of some sort existed between mrs cheyne and jeff a more complete understanding than camilla and her husband had ever had she could not understand it for two persons more dissimilar had never been created mrs cheyne was the last expression of a decadent dynasty jeff the dawning hope of a new one she had taken him up as the season's novelty a masculine curiosity which she had added to her cabinet of eligible amusements camilla's intuition had long since told her of jeff's danger and it had been in her heart the night they separated to warn him against his dainty enemy even now it might not have been too late if he would have listened to her if he would believe that her motive was a part of their ancient friendship if he would meet her in a spirit of compromise if he were not already too deeply enmeshed in rita cheyne's silken net there were too many ifs and the last one seemed to suggest that any further effort in the way of a reconciliation would be both futile and demeaning camilla was now aware that mrs cheyne was going out of her way to make her relations with court conspicuous permissible humor had the two women been friendly under present conditions it was merely impertinence mrs cheyne means said camilla distinctly that the ideal husbands are the ones one can't get and then pointedly don't you mrs cheyne rita glanced at camilla swiftly and smiled her acknowledgment of the thrust they wouldn't be ideal she laughed if we ever got them mrs ray touche whispered billy haviland to larry berkeley delightedly outside there was a merry jingle of sleigh bells and mrs haviland rose come children she said that's for us i wish we had more room at the cove you'll come though court won't you we need another man do you mind if i stay out rita Cortland appealed oh not at all i'm so used to being deserted for mrs ray that i'm actually uncomfortable without the sensation so the party was arranged a long bobsled hitched to a pair of horses was at the door and the women got on while gretchen pelted snowballs at perrault 
and only succeeded in hitting the horses so that camilla and the baroness were spilled out into the snow and the man had a hard time bringing the team to a stop a pitched battle ensued while the three women scrambled into their places cortland and billy covering the retreat at last they all got on and amid a shower of snowballs which the sledders couldn't return the horses galloped up the hill and out into the turnpike which led to the haviland farm End of chapter fifteen